It's nice to see people show up with the we went through the time change last night so I had to calculate <laughs> so I must have picked the right time Our evening psalm is Psalm 4. When I call, answer me, O God of justice. From anguish you released me, have mercy and hear me. O people, how long will your hearts be closed? Will you love what is futile and seek what is false? It is the Lord who grants favors to those whom he loves. The Lord hears me whenever I call him. Fear him, do not sin. Ponder on your bed and be still. 
Make justice your sacrifice and trust in the Lord. What can bring us happiness, many say. Lift up the light of your face on us, O Lord. You have put into my heart a greater joy than they have from abundance of corn and new wine. I will lie down in peace and sleep comes at once. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let us offer our lives to God. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we speak of our lives, our whole lives. We speak of our foolish mistakes and our turning away from you. We speak of our words, thoughts, actions which hurt those around us, as well as hurting you. Forgive us, generous heart, and greet. Create new spirits and new life in us. Amen. We're continuing to use the book Images of Grace, A Journey from Darkness to Light at Easter by Amy Scott Robinson. And tonight we begin a new week and it's going to be Images of Atonement. So here's an introductory section. Christians have always believed that the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection solved the problems of sin and death, which have been caused by the fall of humanity. Somehow the death of Jesus has opened the way into everlasting life and achieved atonement, literally at one moment, unity and reconciliation between God and humanity. That much for most of the church's history is undisputed. But there has been plenty of discussion about how. From the earliest moments of the church, theologians have been coming up with theories about the mechanism of it all, about what exactly was happening on the grand stage of heaven and earth while Christ was on the cross. These are called atonement theories, and there are many, overlapping and contrasting with one another down the centuries. This is not a book about atonement theory, however, in one sense, all those theories deal in the same language as this book and that they almost begin with an image, a metaphor or picture found in the Bible and develop it into a cosmic theory, a larger picture of how God forgave our sin. In that way, they have the same use that all the images in this book have to offer some angles and facets of footholds, some different ways in thinking about concepts that are too big for humanity to grasp. In this week of images, we are going to take a look at some pictures and stories that may lay, lie at the root of these atonement theories. So forgive me if I use this introduction for a whistle-stop tour of some of the theme, 
of some of them, not because any of the passages we will encounter have an exact parallel with any of the theories, but because they weave in and out of them. A very basic summary of atonement theories might help us to orient ourselves as we look at these central biblical images, and they might help us to find what we are looking for this week, which is to gain some idea of what atonement actually is, what it looks like, and what it does. Possibly the earliest atonement theory was that of ransom. The idea was that Adam and Eve had sold humanity into slavery, or were captured into it, so that humanity was now owned by the devil. Ransom theory says that with Christ's death as a ransom, God bought us back from the devil. Following ransom theory came a development of it, Christus Victor, in which Christ fought for us and defeated sin and death on humanity's behalf by going through death as both human and God. This was the overriding theory in the medieval church, leading to texts like the 14th century Piers Plowman in which Jesus fights wearing Piers armor, in other words, as a human being, to trick the devil into a fight he can't win. Partly in answer to those theories came the satisfaction theory, which argued that God cannot owe anything to the devil. Instead, it is sinful humanity that owes a debt to God, which was paid by God himself in Christ's human death. Penal substitutionary atonement theory introduced the idea of punishment, saying that all sin must be punished and that Jesus took our sin on himself and was punished on the cross instead of us. No, said the scapegoat theory, Christ's death was not punishment, but victimhood. It was God answering human violence by substituting himself for the victims of violence like the goat that carried away the people's sins into the wilderness. Meanwhile, in recapitulation theory, Jesus is a new Adam who by leading a perfect life and dying an innocent death undid the sin and death caused by the first Adam and reset human history. I haven't listed all the theories that exist, but you can see how some of the images we've already encountered and some we are about to look at flicker around the way that the church has thought and taught about atonement in the past 2,000 years. That's enough of atonement theories. Now, let's look at the Bible. And if I might just add a personal observation as one who's spent a lot of time, a lot of years thinking about and preaching about and talking about all these atonement theories. Again, it's our human, often weak and poor human attempts to try to understand the mystery of God becoming one of us in life and in death, as well as in resurrection. We will never know until we cross over to this other side of grace what exactly happened and what will happen to us. Anyway, so tonight we deal with the atonement theory of ransom, and the reading is from the first letter of Peter, the first chapter, verses 17 through 21. If you invoke his father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. And then Amy Scott Robinson shares these thoughts. Even though it wouldn't be my first choice for a cozy evening in front of the television, I'm familiar enough with the following crime drama scenario. A white van pulls down, a, drives down a dark street. The person walking on the pavement spots it over his shoulder and breaks into a jog, but he isn't fast enough. 
The van slows just enough for the doors to open and max people to jump out. They fall on the hapless pedestrian and, in one smooth movement, put a bag over his head and scoop him into the van. The next day, the letters start arriving. Words cut out of magazines and newspapers and stuck onto an old paper bag. They demand a colossal price for the return of the kidnapped person to be delivered at a neutral spot on an unnamed date, on a named date, and certain death if any attempt is made at rescue or arrest. When the time comes, a nervous, desperate person climbs shakily out of a car clutching a suitcase full of cash and hands it over for the safe release of their loved one. There are all sorts of reasons for kidnapping, all sorts of demands. We once attended a church where baby Jesus was kidnapped from the crib scene one Christmas Eve. It turned out that the person who had donated The scene many years before was not happy with the church's upkeep of the figurines and was refusing to give Jesus back until they had been fully restored. So what is happening in this image of ransom from the first of Peter's letters? Who is the kidnapper? Whom have they captured? And what what is the ransom demanded for the release? Peter says that the Christians he is writing to were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors. There then is our kidnapper, not the ancestors themselves, but their feudal ways, the things they did or believed. It is unclear whether Peter was writing mainly to Jews or to Gentiles. His letter is addressed to scattered, persecuted followers of Christ. And perhaps identifying these ancestors or exactly what they did is not important. Christians reading these words today can all agree that we have been ransomed from the feudal ways of our ancestors, from the ways, actions, and beliefs of all human ancestry. It is simply another way of saying sin. Sin is the kidnapper. What is the ransom demanded by sin? As we discovered in the previous chapter, sin leads to death almost seamlessly so that where one is mentioned, the other follows logically. Sin does not demand a suitcase full of cash. Sin wants a body. The ransom paid is not silver and gold, but the blood of Christ. Peter uses an extra word when he mentions the silver and gold. They are perishable. In those television shows I mentioned earlier, at the point when the suitcase is handed over, there's generally a sudden commotion as special agents who have been disguising themselves as bushes and statues leap out of their hiding places to overcome the kidnapper, while the camera cuts to equally tense scenes in which others are rescuing the victim. Handing over the money is a last resort because it won't be enough to satisfy the kidnapper. For as long as they are the person with with the upper hand, they'll be able to keep demanding more and more. Money doesn't last, either as a solution or in the hands of a greedy criminal. In contrast, the ransom that Christ paid for us is imperishable. Sin cannot keep us captive, and it can never demand anything else. Christ's ransom lasts forever. So here's the question she poses. What would you pay as a ransom for the person you love the most? And how about you? What are you worth? And then she offers this brief prayer. Thank you, Lord, for paying my ransom with your priceless, everlasting blood. Amen. Guard us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us in the shadow of your wings. Lord, save us. Save us while we are awake. Protect us while we are asleep, that we may keep our watch with Christ. And when we sleep, rest in his peace. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
now and forever, the God who is, who was, and is to come at the end of the ages. Lord, save us. Save us while we are awake. Protect us while we are asleep, that we may keep our watch with Christ. And when we sleep, rest in his peace. I invite you now to join me in a few moments of prayer. As we come to the end of this day, as we look back on the moments, as we think about our lives and our experiences this day, the opportunity perhaps to go to worship, to spend time with family, to share a meal, to take a walk, to watch a show, a sporting event, to take a nap. We can think of all the ways in which we have been blessed, in which we have been graced by our God. And so let us in the silence offer up our prayers of thanksgiving and praise for all that goodness, all that wonder, all that grace that has been poured out upon us. We do indeed thank you, O God, and praise you for your life in us, your grace in us, your hope in us, and that light which watches over us during the night. Amen. Now let us offer up our prayers of need and concern, our prayers for our world, our nations, our communities, our families and friends, uh, for those who struggle, for those who need healing, for those looking for loneliness. Uh, for a community in the midst of loneliness, for those who grieve, for those who simply need the reassurance that God is with them. We pray this night, especially for all those people of faith, however they describe faith, for those who care for others, who know that they are loved unconditionally by God and offer such unconditional love and grace to others. We pray for all those who are affected by weather events. We pray for those who live in the Ukraine for their peace, for reconciliation, for an end to the warfare. Even though they have seemed to disappeared from the news, we continue to pray for the people of Turkey and Syria as they continue to try to rebuild their lives, their communities, and their hopes. We pray for the Reverend Tony Jones, who's home from the hospital for his recovery. And we pray for Hazel and the family as well. We pray for the Vicky, for Vicki Longbone, for the Reverend Louise G and her recovery. We pray with the Reverend Claire and Reverend Brian Davison for their daughter, Susie. We pray for the Reverend Derek Hopkins and his phased return to work as well as for the Reverend Martin Ferris. We pray for the Reverend Stanley Crane as he continues to recover from surgery. We pray for the Reverend Michael and Jean Forster. We pray for the Reverend Graham and Vera Maskery. We pray for Monia's parish priest, Father Andy. We pray with Liz for her great nephew, Ryan, as well as for her daughter, Emma, and for Emma's young son, Leon. We pray for Cheryl and for Prince and the rest of the family in their ongoing care of her. We pray with Andy for his dad, Mike, and we are grateful for the ongoing care that Liz and Ruth offer to Mike. We pray with Irene for John. And we pray for all those who grieve the passing of loved ones. We pray especially at this time for those who grieve for David. And especially we pray for Catherine and Amy and James. We pray for Allison and all who grieve for Alicia on her death, as well as for her boyfriend, Danny, for her Aunt Preeti, and for Shannon. And in the silence of these moments, we would lift up those prayers of need, concern, of longing and hope that we can offer to our God.
Whether they've been spoken aloud or lifted in silence, all of our prayers are offered up in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together using our own words, format, language. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In peace we will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make us dwell in safety. Amen. And now may the peace of the rolling waves, the peace of the silent mountains, peace of the singing stars, and the deep, deep peace of the Prince of Peace be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And may you rest in God's grace and hope this night, friends.